reigned from 1826 to 1890. But Pedro I, the first emperor, who had come originally from Portugal to Brazil, he founded two orders. The first the Imperial Order of Dom Pedro I, and the second, the Imperial Order of the Rose, to commemorate his second marriage to Amelia of Leuchtenburg in 1829. And again, it was always given to reward loyalty. It's actually a very attractive, uh, a very attractive order with those little roses. And here we see Pedro II of Brazil. He's wearing his cape of toucan feathers, but over it, I'm not, you can, practically can't see it, but he is wearing the Order of the Rose. There only ever were two emperors of Brazil, Pedro I, Pedro II. Mexico had two very different short-lived emperors, partly because the Mexicans shoot their emperors. The native Mexican army commander, Agustin de Turbide, who was in power from 1822 to three, and then the Austrian prince, Maximilian of Austria, who reigned from 1860 to 1863. And he, of course, he was a Habsburg. He had come from Austria. He was extremely keen on ceremonial of all kinds. He reigned for such a short time, but he spent a lot of his time designing uniforms and helmets and you know all sorts of things like that. So he, like Augustine, they reigned for a very brief period, but they went to great lengths to show that they were emperors. And it's therefore not surprising that they both invented, what did they invent? Orders of knighthood. Augustine I created the National Order of Guadalupe in 1821. And when Mexi uh, Maximilian arrived in Mexico in 1860, he converted this into the Imperial Order of Guadalupe, and he created two new orders of his own, the Imperial Order of the Mexican Eagle, and for women, the Imperial Order of St. Charles. Now, to finish up, we're finally going to get to the man that you might have expected me to mention first, Napoleon. In 1802, at the age of 32, this army commander had been elected first Consul of France. So he isn't an emperor at all yet. He's first consul of France. Four years later, he had himself elected emperor of the French. The French had deposed and executed their king and queen, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, had got rid of the aristocracy and the court, and had therefore also swept away orders of chivalry, which of course they had had under their royal system. Napoleon proposed at first not an order of chivalry or knighthood, but an order of merit. And he had to convince his colleagues in the then government on the Council of State that this would be instituted. He said he wanted some way to acknowledge achievement of all kinds, mostly bravery on the battlefield or military service, but he also wanted to mark learning, artistic achievement and service to the state. He wanted it, and he's actually wearing the Legion of Honor, uh, the Legion of Honor here. He wanted it to be open to all in the spirit of equality of the French Revolution, and therefore he called it the Legion of Honor. This was kind of a Roman idea. Now, he had great difficulty getting this accepted by, by the government of, of the time. Um, it was only, the legislation was only really barely passed by quite a small majority. Um, but it was from the beginning divided into five, into five classes. Now, in the Council of State, Napoleon was opposed in particular by a man called Councillor Berlier, who said that these things are baubles, baubles or toys. Medals are baubles. The French word is oche for the people who know French here. He said, "These are just, why, why, why? I mean, why do we want to have a Legion of Honor? These are just baubles and ribbons, and they should be reserved for monarchies, for kings. They are unworthy of a republic such as France had become." And Napoleon replied, the Romans had patricians, knights, citizens and slaves. For each thing, they had a different costume, different customs. They observed all sorts of distinctions. And then, the, this is the sort of, these, are, these are, are, the, are the killer sentences. I challenged anyone to show me an ancient or modern republic which has not had distinctions. These are called baubles. Well, it's by means of baubles that people are led. Napoleon was a great cynic, but he also had great insight into people's vanity, I think. After he became emperor in 1806, 
He then made the Legion of Honor much more royal in nature by instituting a grand decoration, the so-called Great Eagle, the Grand Aigle. And uh, he also then instituted these kinds of ceremonies where he made it, you know, such an honor to be given uh, one of these decorations. So he's moved it all back to much more of a kind of royal decoration again. Yes, it's an order of merit, but it's now become something much more like an order of knighthood on the royal pattern. And the Legion of Honor, of course, still exists and is France's highest award today. So I just want to finish with two photographs that I think speak volumes. Oh, sorry, this is, this is Napoleon. Of course, he's wearing, uh, he's wearing the Legion of Honor around his neck. This is, <laughs> this is the man who started as an undistinguished army officer. He becomes an emperor, and he has these coronation robes, and he's wearing, uh, he's wearing this, this round his neck. So, my second last picture. This is um, Alfonso XIII, King of Spain. This is all happening in 1905, so I mean, it's not that long ago in a way. Alfonso XIII, King of Spain, with his cousin, the future King George V. And Alfonso made a state visit to the United Kingdom in 1905. And it was thought polite on such occasions to wear the uniform and decorations of each other's country. So they are both wearing British decorations and Spanish decorations, which is giving you this Christmas tree effect. Alfonso is wearing the uniform of a general of the British Army. He's wearing the Royal Victorian chain, the sash and star of the garter. British decorations. Then he's wearing his Spanish ones, the Order of Charles III, the neck badge of the Golden Fleece, and the badge of the four Spanish military orders. And George is wearing the, you know, a Spanish uniform, and he's wearing the Golden Fleece, the Order of Charles III, etc., the Garter, the Order of St. Michael and St. George. At roughly the same time, here is Sir Bhupinder Singh, the Maharaja of Patiala. Now, he was a remarkable, I mean, you probably all know about him. He was a remarkable man by any standards. He was decorated for his bravery during World War I, in which he served the British in France, Belgium, Italy, and Palestine. He was made a, an honorary major general. He was the Chancellor of the Chamber of Princes for a number of years during the 1920s. He represented India at the League of Nations. He took part in the Round Table Conferences in 1830 to 32, when the political future of India was being discussed. He was, in addition, a first-class cricketer, and he was a notable ladies' man. Now, someone like this is so distinguished that you would think he wouldn't need any medals. Everybody must know who he is, internationally even. But in fact, he collected them. And by the end of his life, he had 23 different medals, including, of course, as when he's wearing them here, the Star of India and the, and the Order of the Indian Empire. He had the French Legion of Honor. He had decorations from all the kings of Europe. And he loved to have himself painted and photographed wearing them. I mean, here he's only wearing a small fraction of the number of medals that he was actually entitled to wear. Once you introduce a system of distinctions and ranks, then of course it becomes a matter of embarrassment to a distinguished man if he does not have these decorations, especially if princes of a similar rank do have them. So of course you can play princes off against each other by giving, you know, by how you're handing out the decorations, just as politicians in Britain still do. And notable people in Britain competed for medals and honours. So did Austrian aristocrats, German army officers, and Indian princes. If you have a system of decorations, you also play to people's vanity. And you can manipulate them by means of these decorations. So looking back on all that I've said about honours and orders and medals, you will have to decide whether you think that Napoleon was right and that in a monarchical system, such as obtained in Britain and its colonies, men and women could be led by baubles, by toys. I leave that up to you to decide. Thank you very much indeed. Sure. So that is the yeah. first question. Second question is, we also had other European colonial powers, which yes. had monarchy, yes. like France, Absolutely. Portugal, Netherlands. Uh, where, or Germany for that matter, were there also 
uh, creating separate chivalric orders uh, for their uh, chiefs in their colonies like the French in Algeria or Tunisia or in Caribbean. And the third is more a, a kind of a sarcasm of our times. What do you think is the bauble driving the most powerful republic of today? <laughs> and you know whom I'm implying. Yes, I know. Yes. I, I, can always, I can always, I can stand, I can stand here as well. I'm not sure, is this, is this actually better? Can you hear me? You can probably hear me better there, I think. I don't have to hold anything. Yeah, well, thank you very much for that, for the thing about the sort of settler colonies. I mean, I'm restricting myself because I have to restrict myself um, to 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 emperors and and to 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 a, um, a territory which is which is being directly ruled by by an emperor because it's it's that that enables me to sort of compare different different systems. Um, so that's the first point there. But thank you very much for the Dominic Levin uh, uh, comparison because of course there's been criticism of you know Dave, David Canada and there's been a lot of discussion and people saying you know this is all too simple and too neat and you know of course you you can disagree you know you can disagree with anything particularly with his analysis of Britain at the period where he's saying you have this stratified society and you apply it to India but nonetheless I don't think we can rule it out completely. So that was that one and the third. The third point you made about um, the French or the Portuguese or whatever, not as far as I know that they were actually creating orders here in India, but it's certainly something worth checking out, but not as far as I know or in, the, in, in, in their colonies generally. I mean, I think if you, if you, in the French system, if you had risen up sufficiently high, then I don't see why you wouldn't get, you know, the uh, order of merit, but it's an interesting thing for me to check how many colonial sort of, b who are thought to be loyal in the, um, in the French um, colonies, how many of them were awarded the, the Legion of Honor. Yeah, but what's so interesting about the, the, the British Raj in India is creating orders just for India to be given to those British who are in India and Indians. You know, they're, they're not bringing this back to Britain at all. And, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's what interests me about it. And then the whole discussion about how you structure it and so on. But thank you very much. Those are, yeah, those are very helpful um, points for me to think about. <laughs> Thank you. I'm coming to this as someone who works on it. Yes. And I was very curious about uh, your thoughts you about... The microphone, oh, yeah. The Can everyone hear me now? Yeah. Is this better? Now it's on me. On me. Okay, I'm trying to project. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. So... <coughs> Hello. Okay, so... Um, I think you've got to hold it. Oh, I've got to hold it like a pop star. I, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. So I was curious about your thoughts about the politics of jewelry and masculinity. Oh, yes. Because one of the things about the orders, especially for the India side, yeah. you're showing us the Maharaja yeah. Patiala here, yeah, yeah, yeah. famous for his Patiala necklace. Oh, yes, right? that's fabulous. Mm -hmm. So the order actually in India, more so than anywhere else, kind of straddles this interesting world of jewelry and the male body. Yes. And I ask this because you started with Winter Halter's portrait yeah. of the Leap Singh. Yes. And yeah. the painted portrait of Victoria that's yeah, yeah, around yeah, his yeah. neck yeah, yeah, uh, was yeah, famously yeah. gifted to him. And Natasha Eaton has actually compared it with a slave collar almost. Oh, yes. Which is a very oh, dear, interesting yes. comparison. Praise but God, uh, yeah. the Leap Singh's father, Ranjit yes. Singh, would famously start giving uh, the British, especially um, Lord Auckland when he was yeah. visiting yeah. him during camp, uh, portraits of himself because he very quickly realized how, how miserly the East India Company yes. was because <laughs> the expectation was jewels yeah, of course. in exchange yes. for Victoria's you know, miniature portrait. Yeah. And of yeah, course yeah. we know the value between these two yeah. is vastly different. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one question for you, so this is kind of a comment, but the yeah, question yeah. for you is, especially with jewelry and masculinity, mm. is that when the Star of India, or any of these orders mm. is actually re is awarded, the expectation is that jewels will come back uh, to uh, the royal family. And this was kind of a golden rule of understanding. Mm. So Kuch Bihar, for instance, yes. it, because they didn't have the number of gun salutes as Baroda did, actually lavish jewels on oh, Queen Victoria. Yeah. So any yeah. thoughts about these kind of yeah. the, the subtext underneath oh, yes. this is very oh, much yes. wrapped 
around oh, yes. gems and jewels and the body and yes. Yes. And, it, and, it, and it's an interesting counterpoint to the mm. militaristic gun salute, which uh, proclaims a particular type yes, of masculinity. But with the Indian princes, they were also seen as effeminate because of the way they presented themselves, yes. right? Yes. And jewelry plays a very key yeah. role in defining the body as such. So if you could talk a little bit yes, about the Yes, exactly. Frames, yes, and of course, the, uh, I mean, we all know the history of the, of the Koh -i -Noor diamond, yeah. which when Victoria got her hands on it, she was not going to give that back again, ever again. And, and of course, there's, I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of wryly comic in a way, this, this complete imbalance between the sort of gifts that were given. You know, the, sometimes the, the East India Company officials, or indeed later on, were, were, were giving gifts as though they were going to some sort of savage tribe in the bush. And they're coming to have a durbar with some, you know, prince who, who is, has a sophistication in, in, his, in his costumes and in his palace and in the way he's living. And, and, and he's handing over, yeah, he's certainly handing over jewels. I mean, I think that they were, that, that there was definitely, I mean, I think that's, that's a, you know, is, is a known point that the British were, were very, very keen to get valuable gifts back and were, but then they had a whole series of rules about what you could accept and whether you could re-gift things, that you, you would get a gift, but you could pass it on, which again, I think, from an Indian point of view, would be a very insulting thing to do. But you, you know, so, so there's, I mean, the, one, it's one of the things Bernard Cohn writes about, about the, the, you know, all of that. I think the whole p business about the masculine body is fascinating. Have you published on it? Have you, would, would you give me the reference afterwards? I'd be very happy to, because of course, from a, um, from, from, from a European point of view, while all their rulers are also draped in jewels, nonetheless, something like the Patiala necklace or, you know, all those ropes of pearls around, are seen as this is kind of women's, you know, there's, there's a sort of a gender thing to seen as women's jewelry, whereas of course in India it isn't. But so I'd be very glad to read, please, if you'd, if you, if you'd pass me on the, on the reference, I'd be most grateful. And please, any more references from anybody, please bring them this way. <laughs> Thank you so much, Helen. Add something, going back to the question about other colonial powers. Yes, yes. Yeah. But it was a French family that was given the, the title. Mm -hmm. Whether it ranked among the French nobility or was just the colonial bauble, I don't know. Yes. But the graves can still be seen of two princes of Chandigarh. Oh, really? Oh, interesting. Yes, thank you. Another place to go and visit. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. I had a small question about the... Uh, is do you think it's is is it possible because we we sort of compare the British imperial experience in India and the yeah. British imperial attitudes to India uh, with imperialism in the New World? There is a lot yes. of difference between yes. what the Spanish and the yes. Portuguese did in the yes. New World. Yes. So there is linguistic and religious conversion there. Yeah. There is physical yeah. destruction and so on and so forth. Yeah. And there is certainly nothing like the yeah. British production of a lot of knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, Orientalist mm. knowledge about Indian customs and so on mm. and so forth. So I'm wondering, uh, do you have any any statistics for the k kind of, for the number of such awards given by the Portuguese in Brazil or mm, the Spanish mm, in mm, Mexico mm. to the native population? H how would, mm. you know, how, mm. how would... Mm the hmm. sort of, you know, as, as, as a tool of t ensuring yeah. and obtaining loyalty, loyalty. Of, of the local yeah. population, yeah. Yeah. how does that play out in comparison to what the British do in India to how the, yeah. you know, what, what's yeah. that? Is, is there any, any, any comparison in the imperial dynamics to um, relationship? I think I'll know that when I've, when I've got further along with the project. But I think, first of all, I mean, Mexico is a very strange case because you have two very short-lived. Uh, uh, empires, or if, if we can even call them empires, but two short, very short-lived emperors. Um, Brazil is a different um, is a different case. Um, statistically, uh, which was your question, um, 
I don't. I I simply don't have numbers, but but the the whole point of having these orders was again to bind, you know, Im, Im, important native native people. Brazil, is, of course, is, is very very um, complex because they had Portuguese in Brazil, they had Creoles in Brazil, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, and um, they uh, they were, I think, trying to establish an empire. Without, I don't think they were really understanding the country. That, well, you might say Britain didn't understand the country it was in either. But I think that the, when the Brazilian monarchy fled from Napoleon and came to, came to Brazil in 1808, I certainly don't think they, they understood the country they were coming to. And a lot of the country was not accessible to them. You know, there were no roads going out of Rio. The only way to kind of get to somewhere else was to get into a ship and go along the coast and land. Because, you know, it was simply sort of cut off from the hinterland. So... Um, the, the society in Rio, when they did land, was small. I mean, the actual, the actual number of people was small, and something like 60% of the people who were in the city were, were slaves. They were black slaves. So, so you had a very, very small um, elite. Um, but again, that, that's a very good point. It's just to compare how, how large or how small was the elite that you were that you were trying to rule the country with, because it's always one of the things that's commented on with regard to India, that actually there were very few British in India compared to the, whatever, 300 or 400 million, you know, um, Indians. And then you had this very small number of British people. Um, but yeah, but th those are all points for me to ponder on. Yes, yes, yeah, look, yeah. look here. Could you yes. point out which part? Because it's looking a little vague to me. Oh, it's very vague. I can get you another one right down. I think a I've got it. A little more a sharper image. Yes, let me, let me go away down here to the end of this. Because there were stamps. Uh, one of the ways where people knew what supported, what she looked like. Let me just go right down here. Ah, here you are. Now, you've got, you've got one postage stamp which looks like she really looked like. And look at the other two and, and, the, and the profile on the coin. I mean, if, if uh, you know, she's, she's ruling over, over India for all those decades, this is what people thought she looked like, those, the, the top two stamps and the coin. And, and it's, it's supposed to be making her look um, I think more acceptable to <laughs> to to the Indians because, as you can see.